morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Law Schoolers. In this episode, well, in our previous episode, we had just finished our discussions about reoccurring searches. And so now what the question is, if there is an unlawful search or an unlawful seizure, what are the potential remedies for that unlawful search and seizure? So that is really what our next three episodes are going to be discussing We're going to be talking about those remedies for unreasonable searches and seizures. What are those remedies? Well, you have primarily two remedies. You've got the exclusionary rule, and I guess we'll say three remedies. You've got officer tort liability, and then you also have officer criminal liability. But these first two episodes are going to be talking about the exclusionary rule, That's what this one is going to primarily focus on. And then we will also, the next episode is going to focus on the limitations of the exclusionary rule. And then our final episode related to this material is going to be for officer liability and for misconduct in uh, searches and seizures. So let's go ahead and start with the exclusionary rule and how it works, what it is, and everything about it. We have three cases. We've got Weeks versus United States, we've got People versus Cahan, and we have Map versus Ohio. And these are all very uh, common, very well known cases. So let's go ahead and just uh, hop into these. Well, let's talk about what the exclusionary rule is. The exclusionary rule is going to apply when evidence has been obtained illegally. If the evidence is obtained illegally, then it may not be considered at trial. Thus, it is being excluded at trial. So what happened in Weeks versus United States? Well, the defendant had been sending lottery tickets through the mail in violation of a federal criminal statute. Unknown to the defendant, the officers and the city marshal had searched the defendant's home without a warrant. Clearly, this is a violation uh, of uh, of a search. Uh, there is no warrant. There is no exigent circumstance. This is a illegal search from which they took several papers proving that the defendant had actually engaged in this criminal activity. So what is our reasoning? What is going to happen here? Well, at the time of founding, the remedy for error was a tort claim against the officer who had engaged in improper search. That's officer liability. At the time of founding, that was the only means of remedy. The natural result of this was that evidence would still be emitted even if it was obtained illegally. Here, however, in this case, the court says that the failure to return the papers was an error, so the evidence should be excluded. Why? Why is that? Why is this the reason? Well, the Fourth Amendment is meaningless without a remedy. In other words, the court wants to focus on the judicial integrity and the integrity of the Constitution. This rule that we're talking about here in Weeks versus United States is extended in Silver Silverthorne Lumber Co. versus United States. In that case, the evidence was illegally obtained, returned, and then legally obtained through a subpoena uh, ducis tecum. In that case, the court determined that the evidence was still going to be excluded, and this is called the doctrine of the fruit of the poisonous tree. That is, you can't obtain material illegally, return it, and then go back and say, okay, now that we have the probable cause, now we have a valid warrant, now we're going to take the evidence properly. No, you can't do that. And that's what Silverthorne Lumber Co. ultimately says. So even after the Fourth Amendment was incorporated and applied to the states, the states are still left to decide for themselves whether they were to going to adopt the exclusionary rule. That is Wolf versus Colorado that says that, but after weeks was passed, many of the states decided uh, to, sorry, it, many of the states actually decided not to adopt the exclusionary rule, meaning that you could still admit the evidence uh, even though weeks had come down. This change, though, in People versus Cahan. So what happened in People versus Cahan? Well, Cahan and, uh, and others were suspected of a conspiracy to create books for horse races against uh, state law. Uh, to gather the evidence, officers snuck into Cahan's house 
and they set a recording wire under his nightstand, and the recorded conversations led to the evidence that convicted the defendant. Well, clearly, this is an illegal search. You're sneaking into the home. You don't have a warrant to do so, so on and so forth. Clearly an illegal search. So, are we going to apply the exclusionary rule? Well, those who want the exclusionary rule are going to argue that the rule is necessary because of judicial integrity. That was the ruling in weeks, uh, which is the court should not be involved in encouraging illegal searches. You have another of deterrence, which is the officer should be afraid of losing the evidence due to illegal searches. And then other remedies have not proved successful. Obviously, it's kind of hard to uh, argue against the state, against officers. Uh, Qualified immunity is a tough burden for defendants to overcome. And, well, I guess for plaintiffs to overcome against officers. And for that reason, other remedies are not being very helpful. But those who want, uh, sorry, for those who don't want the exclusionary rule, They argue that the evidence still has the same value of proving the crime regardless of how it is obtained. They also argue it is costly to let lawbreakers go free because that evidence is going to be excluded, especially if it's the one piece of evidence that you have and it's necessary for a conviction. There is no evidence showing that deterrence has any effect, meaning there's no evidence showing that the exclusionary rule deters officers from engaging in misconduct and there are still other available remedies meaning you can still go after officers for misconduct so those are the arguments for and against the exclusionary rule and why states ought to apply or ought not to apply the exclusionary rule so this kind of leads into Matt versus Ohio because of these arguments that are presented in People v. Cahan, of the states trying to decide whether or not the exclusionary rule should be applied, because constitutionally it didn't have to be applied to the states, see Wolf versus Colorado, Matt v. Ohio changes all of that. The takeaway from Matt v. Ohio is that the exclusionary rule is going to apply to all states. What happened in Matt v. Ohio? Well, officers were informed that the defendant here had material that was related to a recent bombing. The officers came to Mapp's home, and she demanded a warrant. She had watched TV. She knew that she had asked for a warrant. Uh, And you should do more than watch TV. I'm not saying that that is the only means of obtaining, obtaining your legal information. In fact, it's often incorrect. But she asked for a warrant. Well, they came back a few hours later. Uh, They broke into her home, and when she demanded a warrant, they showed her a piece of paper. Well, she grabbed the paper uh, that the officers were claiming was a warrant and uh, stashed it away, and the officers arrested her and searched her home. That piece of paper was not a warrant, and this is clearly an illegal search. Well, the search produced illegal obscene material, which was used to convict her of the crime of obtain of possession of obscene material, not uh, related to material of a bombing that she was suspected of having part of. So at trial and on the appeal, the evidence was not excluded because this state, Ohio, had not adopted the exclusionary rule unless there was a sh- showing of brutal or excessive force. So on a trial and appeal, it was not excluded because there was not a showing of brutal or excessive force. So what happened here at the Supreme Court level, the United States Supreme Court level? Well, the court wants federal oversight to exist over the rule. And the court wants uniformity between the states. For these reasons, the exclusionary rule is going to apply to each and every state. So the dissent argues, though, that the rule is not uniform because each state still has the freedom to apply the rule in different ways. 
how they can define exclusion, what parts are going to be excluded, what parts uh, might have more exclusionary aspects than others. And then the textual intent of the Constitution provide a tort claims as a remedy instead of exclusionary claims as your remedy. A couple of additional notes. Note that in Matt versus Ohio, judicial integrity was not a reason that was listed for applying the exclusionary rule to all the states. Instead, we talked about uniformity as the primary reason, and then also federal oversight over the states as being another primary reason. Deterrence, minimal uh, discussion on deterrence, but then also judicial integrity, nearly no discussion in Matt versus Ohio. So our takeaway there is that judicial integrity is no longer a consideration when determining whether or not the exclusionary rule should be applicable. Our second takeaway is that the exclusionary rule is not essential, but it is prudential to the Constitution. So the rule could be overturned uh, with no concern, and it can be done by Congress without having any constitutional limitations. That's important to know. Will the exclusionary rule be overturned? Not likely, but because that is the primary method of remedy that is seen throughout the United States. So that is the exclusionary rule. Well, let's just sum up what we talked about. The exclusionary rule just simply says that if evidence is obtained illegally, it should be excluded. Uh, Weeks versus United States first outlined the interest of having an exclusionary rule. That interest in that case was primarily focused on judicial integrity. In, pers- in People v. Cahan, uh, it was left up for the states to decide whether or not to apply the exclusionary rule. And for this reason, uh, Cahan explores the several different reasons of why to ex- uh, expand or not expand the exclusionary rule to apply to the states. And then you have Matt versus Ohio, which does apply the exclusionary rule to all the states, and it cites federal oversight, and it cites uh, uniformity between the states as the primary reasons for applying the exclusionary rule. And then last but not least, the exclusionary rule is not an integral part of the Constitution. Congress could change how evidence is going to be included or excluded, and they would do so without any fear of having any constitutional limitations there as well. All right, so that's the exclusionary rule. In our next episode, we will be focusing on the limitations of the exclusionary rule. In other words, when can evidence still be admitted, even if it is seized illegally? All right, that's it for now. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Law Schoolers. Before I let you go, there are four things I want to say. The first thing is if you enjoyed these episodes and if you enjoyed the website, I would invite you to go and join Law Schoolers Pro. And you can do that by going to lawschoolers.com slash join. It's a way for you to support us, but there's also a lot of features there that I think you will enjoy. Second thing is that nearly all of our episodes are unedited, the only ones that aren't our pre-law materials, and the reason for that is so you can actually see the legal material in its raw form as I'm learning it as well. The third thing is that the information contained in these episodes are specifically only for educational purposes. They're not to be used as legal advice, and with that, the fourth thing is if it is used as legal advice, we are not liable. That is, law schoolers is not liable for any legal outcomes. Thank you again for enjoying the show. Have a good one.